And our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, to hear the word of God. He saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. And then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus's knees saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who are partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And again, let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I want to share with you, I checked Facebook this morning, and the first thing in my feed was, was this, a, a picture of a teacher standing in front of a chalkboard like this. And this is from a friend from high school who's a teacher. And it says, if you love a teacher, pray daily that God will renew their passion, joy, and love in their professional calling. Because while the entire world fights over a shot, teachers everywhere are fighting to keep their desire to serve. And I thought, that goes with my sermon this morning. Let me share that. I listen to podcasts on my way to and from work. I just marvel that that's a thing. And I'm so grateful for it. And on one podcast this week, I heard, we are not okay. Coming from a therapist, we are not okay. And on another podcast, a, a lectionary podcast, which is two pastors talking about the scripture passages from this week. And one of them started, every pastor that I know is tired. We are weary. And I know it's not just pastors. We're weary of making plans and having to cancel them. We're weary of being on hold, but not on hold. Questioning our decisions, wanting to move forward, but not being able to. And the health concerns of every ache and pain, is it COVID? Should I get tested? The cases are going down, but the death rate is still way too high, 2,600 people. Is it a day or a week? It's a day, right? And it's in there. It's part of our brain. It's spinning with that all the time. I remember during lockdown, counseling folks, you know, just be gentle with yourselves, be gentle with each other. This is really tough. And it continues. I've discovered uh, somebody by the name of Tabitha Brown. She's a, she, you know, she's an influencer. Now that I've, now that my sister gave me a, a book that she wrote for Christmas and I read it and now I see her everywhere. And she has this saying and she's, and she's from, and she's from North Carolina. And she says, you know, have a good day, but if you can't, don't you dare go miss, messing up nobody else's. I think that's brilliant. Right. Have a good day, but if you can't, don't you dare go messing up nobody else's. The lectionary uh, podcast that I was listening to, the pastors were saying, you know, we, we try to read into what 
you know, what was happening in Jesus's time. We try to figure out the context there, but our context changes every time we come to scripture and different things jump out at you. And what jumped out at them and what jumped out at me was Peter was weary. Peter was tired. He had been out all night in that, in that boat trying to catch fish and nothing. And they had already washed the nets and they're calling it a day. And Jesus said, hey, can I, you know, if you read it, he got in the boat first and said, okay, <laughs> take me out. Uh, but take me out a little farther. I'd like to talk with the people because people were pressing in on him. And I, as a kid, I always thought that was, you know, so, so weird. What do you mean? Why is he going farther away from the people? But I remember my, my, my grandparents home up in Vermont was on a lake and their house was like right at the top of the hill and we'd go down to the water and my mother would go, shh, your voice is carry. You could hear everything up in the house because the water, the voice here just bounces off the water, right? And so I get it now. And Lake Gennesaret was another, it's a local name for the, the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee was actually a lake, but right. So the, what the, his voice would just bounce off and he talk from the boat. We don't know what he said, which is interesting. But when he was done, he said, let's go out a little further. And it's a deeper water and cast your nets again. And just imagine Peter going, oh, Lord, we did that all night and we're tired. And we, you know, and doesn't say this, but in his head, we cleaned the nets. But because you asked me to, we'll do it. And by the way, he, Peter already had a relationship with, with Jesus. He already, the, his mother-in-law had already been uh, cured. He had stayed at Peter's home, right? So this, the call comes now, but the relationship had already been forged a little bit. So because it's you, I'll cast my net. And then the miracle happened. And Peter is on his knees, feeling awe and feeling unworthy which is Isaiah, same thing, right? I'm a man of unclean lips, living amongst a people of unclean lips, which reminds me of a couple stories. One, my friend Peter told me this one and he read it in a book. These two pastors became friends and one of the pastors had a real potty mouth, right? And they're hiking, they're going for a hike and, and the one is just letting it fly because that's how he talks. And the other one at one point just marveled and said, you know, say his name, Billy Bob. How in heaven's name are you a pastor with that mouth? And he goes, cause I'm called gosh darn it. But he didn't say gosh darn it. You know what he said, right? And cause I'm called. And there's a, there's a pastor who's, uh, you might have, might have heard of her. Her name is Nadia Bowles Weber. She's, she's written three books. They're all brilliant. Uh, she is a recovering alcoholic and drug addict. And curses like a sailor, but, and she's covered in tattoos. Who, are, what's her mission field? You know, who are the people that, that she connects with? People who are, who curse like sailors and are recovering and they show up as they are and they know they are loved and accepted. And, you know, and so for everyone who says, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, you know, person of unclean lips, living amongst the people of unclean lips. God is like, great, I need you. Because I have people who think that they need to clean themselves up in order to come into my house. I need you to work with them, to talk with them. Amen. Right? I also want you to notice that the lack of faith is not in God from Peter, from Isaiah. It's lack of faith in themselves. And Jesus tells them, do not be afraid. Together, we are going to fish for people, which I, whenever I hear that, I remember some song from Sunday school or vacation Bible school when I was little, did you have it? I will make you fishers of men, only my church fishers of men. Anyway, right, but then we switch it to fishers of people. It's the evangelistic rallying cry 
to which biblical scholar Ched Meyer says we get it wrong. He writes, there is perhaps no expression more traditionally misunderstood than Jesus's invitation to these workers to become fishers of men. This metaphor, despite the grand old tradition of missionary interpretation, does not refer to the saving of souls as if Jesus were conferring upon these men instant evangelist status. Rather, the image is carefully chosen from Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 16, where it is used as a symbol of God's censure of Israel. Elsewhere, the hooking of fish is a euphemism for judgment upon the rich in Amos and the powerful in Ezekiel. Taking this mandate for his own, Jesus is inviting common folk to join him in his struggle to overturn the existing order of power and privilege. Remember the Jubilee theme? Mary's Magnificat, Jesus' first sermon, right? This would follow along with that. It's an interesting take and something to wrestle with. But even if you want to make it a, a purely spiritual catch, right? When we give our lives over to Jesus, we abandon worldly values, which are conquest and greed. And we abandon ourselves to loving our neighbors as ourselves. And every possession that we have becomes a tool for ministry, every gift, every talent, either way, a revolution. But I don't want to focus so much on the catch as on the ones called to throw their lives into the ring of ministry and not look back. Let's let Jesus's words echo off the water and cascade down through the generations to our ears. Do not be afraid. And let us be inspired by Peter. We're weary. But because Jesus asks us to, we're going to keep on keeping on. We'll keep on getting out of bed and making the bed and showing up, trying to fit, find ways to love on God's people. In Jesus' name. Which reminds me of this story years ago. I don't know how many years ago. It's so funny to be at this point where I can say maybe decades ago in ministry. And I want to say that I am, I am a first career pastor. So high school, college, seminary, you know, and uh, right into, into the church ordained. It's amazing that they ordained me at that young age. What did I know? But so I have decades, you know, it could be decades ago that this, this happened. But it, I think it was a Sunday afternoon and I was tired. I was tired. And the phone rang and I saw who it was and I knew it wasn't going to be a short conversation because it was never a short conversation with this person. And I was tired and I was like, oh, really, Lord? Really? Oh. But I picked up the phone and I was listening and I was listening. And then, you know, the Holy Spirit, just an idea popped in my head and I thought, well, Let's see. And I, and he was bearing his, I'm going to call him Jehoshaphat. So it's none of your names, right? So Jehoshaphat was just bearing his soul and struggling. And it thought, it occurred to me to ask this question. Does this have anything to do with a homosexual experience in the past? And boom, the Holy Spirit. And when I talk about the Holy Spirit, I know we all have different experiences of the Holy Spirit and I can only testify to my own. I have talked with colleagues who have never had the same experiences of the Holy Spirit that I have, but I knew just waves. I knew that I was on the right track and, and he broke open and shared. It was, it was, unbelievable. And what I remember is I'm exhausted. And yet God used that moment. Even if I was resentful, God used my tiredness. And when I shared the story, or when I thought to share the story because of just being weary and being tired, it also occurred to me that, oh my gosh, this also relates because Peter felt unworthy. Isaiah, Isaiah felt unworthy. Joseph, Jehoshaphat felt unworthy because he'd been raised to believe that he was not okay. And I said to him, 
I do not believe that homosexuality is a sin. I believe that God created some people to be gay. I mean, it's existed forever. I mean, they wrote about it in Leviticus. What if you were to read scripture that when it says that after God created everything, God said it is good and you were part of God's good creation. What if you were to believe with the psalmist that you were knit together in your mother's womb and fearfully and wonderfully made? Because I know that God did not create you to walk around feeling like garbage. He was not in a place or a position or in a space to accept that at the time, but I pray that he's in a different space and a different place. Old Testament theology, and I just wanna to speak to the fact of people who were born differently. Old Testament theology would say that if, if somebody was born with any kind of difference, you know, we, I think we used to say somebody who, you know, any kind of, uh, well, any kind of difference, let's leave it at that, um, differently abled, that it was a result of somebody's sin. Somebody was getting punished. There in John 9, everyone who I know, including myself, who was born differently abled, knows John 9. When the disciples asked Jesus, this man was born, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his sin or his parents' sin? And Jesus said, nobody's sin. This man was born blind so that God could be glorified in him. And he does get healed, but that's not how God is glorified. God can be glorified in anybody and everybody. You can glorify God from a wheelchair. You can glorify God blind or colorblind, deaf or tone deaf, tall, short, fat, thin, brown, black, pasty white with freckles. God can be glorified through you. Peter felt unworthy. Isaiah felt unworthy. Jehoshaphat felt unworthy. We all can feel unworthy for this, that, or the other thing. And God says, don't be afraid. We're going to fish for people together. And that can mean different things. It can mean to tell people that there's freedom on the other side of repentance. There's beautiful freedom on the other side of repentance. It could also mean that we're going to together tear down unjust structures, or we're going to expose the way that rich people uh, exploit poor people. I think it can be all of the above, but God can use you. God can use us, no excuses, even when we're weary. So the tantrum of 2020 became the tantrum of 2021, became the tantrum of 2022. I don't wanna live this way. I don't wanna do ministry this way. But despite our weariness, we're gonna keep on encouraging one another. We're gonna keep telling our stories. I was encouraged this week, uh, two different people in two different settings told of neighbors who anonymously dug out their cars and, you know, and even did the roof of the car, right? And around the car in the driveways and all of that. There are good people in the world. We need to be telling those stories. One of you had gloves and hats sent to the, to the church. It might've been socks. I just saw the outside package because you heard online, thank you, that Mesh needed it. Ah, good people looking for good ways to show love on all of God's children, even though we're tired, even though we're weary. And I need to confess to you that I am not immune to this weariness. You know, every, you know, every single week, I, if I'm not preaching to myself, there's a problem. But this, this one, uh, I... I coach other pastors and I also get coached. And I think I started my coaching session this week with, I don't know what's wrong with me. 
And I want to offer an apology, you know, just things that I know that I should do, I haven't done. Uh, I want to apologize to anybody who I have been really, really, really slow at answering your email. I know it's there and, you know, and I, there's part of me saying it's unprofessional and it's not, you know, and it sends, mm, and, but it's part of the weariness. And my, what does my coach say? Okay, so what are you gonna do? Like when you're grieving, you get out of bed in the morning, you make the bed, you do what you need to do. So my coaching was that, you know, once a day, set an hour, you know, figure it out when's that hour you're gonna be that you're gonna answer emails. But uh, so the thing that I, I'm, I'm apologizing publicly because there's always a person on the other side of that email. It, it's not a stack of paper. And so if, if that has been you, please forgive me. But, uh, or let me say not but, but thank you for your grace. God is calling us in our weariness and our tiredness to keep on keeping on. And I'm not saying to push yourself to the point of exhaustion or not to listen to yourself because self-care, self-care, self-care. But part of our self-care is doing things to help other people because that builds up our soul and our spirits. The best thing that we can do when God calls us to, to the best thing that we can do for ourselves is to follow. God can do miracles through us, even when we're tired. To the glory of God, in the name of Jesus, may it be so. Amen.